Jewish. And so that's a poignant history. But if you are a Bible believer in Jesus, that's not your history. But recognize that for many Jewish people, they're going to lump you together with people who perpetrated those horrible deeds. And that's why it's critically important to to understand a little bit about Jewish history. What we say here, it's impossible to truly understand our Christian faith while dismissing God's relationship with Israel. Several years ago, uh, a very well-known TV preacher made the unfortunate comment uh, as he spoke about church growth. He said one way to spur church growth was to unhitch from the Old Testament. And that was a very sad and ignorant remark, because if you unhitch from the Old Testament, you have absolutely no Christianity. Uh, There would not have been a babe in the manger without the prophecies in the Jewish Bible. And so, indeed, that was a very unfortunate and silly statement, which he regretted (laughs) within a few days. So we want to do two things at the same time. We want to understand the significance of the Jewish roots of our faith, of our evangelical Christian faith, but at the same time recognize that as those who have embraced faith in Jesus as the Messiah, he's the Mashiach, he's the, the promised one, we are no longer under Mosaic law. We are not under law, but we are under grace. I embrace grace. My understanding of the Bible is a a very traditional evangelical view. It lines up with uh, traditional understandings, and it embraces the grace that we have, which was purchased for us on the cross by Messiah. And so I am not advocating anyone to change their doctrine, Uh, In fact, the group of churches to which this video will go out, this, I am right in line with that. Why? Because you're in line with the Bible. It's not so much that I'm in line with you, but we are all in line with what God says in the scripture. And that's really what we need to be. And so we say here, uh, amongst these three scripture verses, we say that Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 22, Salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. Uh, He, of course, Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well who was of a mixed background, and she had very different religious ideas than the Jewish people did. She recognized that Jesus was a Jew. She said, how is it that you being a Jew are talking to a Samaritan woman? And so he was recognized very clearly. He looked like a Jew. He spoke like a Jew. He worshiped at Jerusalem. And she wondered, Typically, Jewish men wouldn't have spoken to her, but of course, this was the Son of God. This was the Messiah. He knew her story, and he said to her very clearly, you know, I've not popped out of heaven to begin something brand new, but rather the message I have, the salvation message, is a message that the Jewish prophets spoke of for hundreds of years Salvation is from the Jews. It's, it's found within the Jewish people who would bring to the world, they would bring to the world the scriptures. So the Bible was written by Jewish penmen, and of course, Jesus the Messiah was born to a Jewish woman. So he said, salvation is from the Jews. Secondly, in the book of Matthew, this is one of the first verses I ever read in the New Testament. I had been told as a child, I grew up in New York City, by the way, grew up in New York City. Both my parents, of course, are Jewish. Both came from uh, somewhat uh, traditional cultural backgrounds. My mother was a lifelong Yiddish speaker. She actually uh, was born into a Yiddish speaking home. It was her mother tongue, and (laughs) she only learned English after being uh, placed in kindergarten. And that was the place she learned English in Brooklyn, New York. And so I grew up in a very uh, Jewish cultural home, and to this day, my wife and I, my wife is also Jewish and a believer in Jesus as the Messiah, we continue to maintain a a culturally Jewish home, and a Jewish home that is centered around Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua, of course, is the Hebrew name of Jesus, and it's a name which we often use to simply point out and to emphasize the Jewish nature of his claims. And so in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the scripture simply reads, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. The very first verse in the Christian Bible immediately references the fact that Jesus did not come as a brand new religion, but rather he came as the Messiah promised in the Jewish Bible. 
So this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, King David, greatest king of Israel, the son of Abraham, who's the first Jew. So in this very first verse, in the first book of the New Testament, you have three people mentioned and they're all Jewish. And so growing up, I always imagined that the New Testament was an anti-Semitic book. It was a book on how to persecute the Jewish people. That's the, the rumor that went around my old neighborhood from the older folks who came from Europe. But of course, as soon as I opened the New Testament, I was reading a Jewish book about the Jewish Messiah written by Jewish men. <laughs> and so that is the message that all believers need to understand. That doesn't make it any less Christian. Let me say that loud and clear. Recognizing, acknowledging the Jewish roots of your faith does not make you any less Christian. It also does not make you Jewish. Uh, if you were born as a Gentile, you will remain a Gentile. I was born as a Jew, I will remain a Jew. In the scripture it says very clearly we should not seek to change that whom we are, and actually we cannot. Uh, so there is no such thing as a spiritual Jew. It's, a, it's, it's a, an idea that comes from a, a little bit of uh, twisted thinking on some of the passages. And in other videos, we clear that up. But this Matthew chapter one, verse one passage is very critical to understand that people were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for a savior to appear and when Yeshua when Jesus appeared in the Jewish community, many people did recognize that he was the Messiah. Even in his, in his own hometown synagogue, there were some who recognized him. Sadly, the scripture record is that the majority did not. And that majority got to determine the future course of Judaism. And so that's where we stand today. Finally, the last uh, passage on this uh, slide, Romans chapter 11, the entire chapter makes a differentiation between Israel and the church, and very importantly, promises a future for ethnic Israel. Again, this is the point of contention, and I won't hide that from you, that even within evangelical circles, this is a point of dispute. Um, I'm making this video because I've been invited to share these things, and my position, I would say to you, is a scriptural position, uh, that God has a continuing plan and program for Israel, in spite of what some doctrinal statements might say. Uh, there were doctrinal statements drafted by certain European churches in the 1700s that tried to cut Israel out of the Bible. They imagined that they were replacing Israel. But again, your status as a child of God is not threatened by acknowledging the Jewish roots of the faith. So don't feel threatened. Uh, don't feel as though you're, you're any less a Christian. Rather, all the first Christians were all Jews, and we, we un need to understand that simple fact. So Romans 11 pretty much um, is a death blow to all those false theologies that try to write Israel out of the Bible. Now, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the ethnic people. I'm not talking about the current nation of Israel. The current state of Israel in the Middle East is a very important matter, and we're going to talk about that toward the end of this video. Uh, it's important that you understand the distinctions. However, when we use the term Israel, we're just using it in a general uh, sort of way to basically delineate and to describe the entirety of the Jewish people. So who are the Jewish people? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, they are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we'll We'll detail that as we get to the Abrahamic covenant. So it's very important for us as believers to understand, to accept these things. And accepting these things, again, does not diminish our standing as Christians, but rather it makes us better informed about the scripture. Nothing that I'm going to teach in this series of videos are outside of standard evangelical understanding. In fact, if you would go to some good seminaries, you would uh, go to good Bible colleges, you would see that toward the advanced courses, many of these principles are taught. And it is said that uh, too often they are left for advanced Bible study. But really, in my understanding, this should be basic. This should be basic to our understanding 
of who we are as believers. So let me go to the next slide, and we will talk about the Abrahamic covenant. In the scripture, God makes a number of formal legal agreements with either people in general, with uh, the world in general. Uh, The uh, Noahic covenant is made with all the peoples of the world. And that's a separate covenant. I have other videos that, uh, that explain and talk about the various covenants of the Bible. But the Abrahamic covenant is first seen in Genesis chapter 12. It is made initially with just one man, with a man named Avram originally, and his name went from Avram to Abraham, father of many nations. And God's relationship to the Jewish people, again, not to the, the current state of Israel in the Middle East, and that's, that's an important matter we'll talk about toward the end, but God's relationship to Israel is based upon God's promise. God sovereignly, God unilaterally made a decision to call a man by the name of Avram to separate him out from the pagan nations around him and to call him to a different sort of life, a separated life. And that separation would be a separation that would ensure that the scriptures reach mankind and would ensure that the Savior is born. Uh, Now, Satan doesn't like the scriptures, and Satan doesn't like the Savior. But Satan's arm is too short to box with God, and so recognizing that, Satan puts a bullseye. Satan has targeted. Satan hates the Jewish people. Satan is the instigator and the inspiration behind idiotic, racist anti-Semitism. Why? Because the Jewish people are going to be the vehicle through which God will give to the world the scriptures and the Savior. Any individual who cooperates in any way with anti-Semitism is doing the bidding of Satan. Why? Because imagine for a second, Satan understands that the Messiah was to come through the Jewish people. Satan also understands that the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, is the beginning of the end of him. We see that promise back in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 15. All the, the fall of mankind in Genesis chapter 3, and the subsequent uh, charge to Satan there in verse 15, and so on. And so... Satan understands that it will be the Jewish people who are going to give birth to the Messiah. Why do we see so much war in the Old Testament? It is the direct effort of Satan to cut off the line of the Jewish people. So Satan employs pagan, idolatrous nations to try to cut off the line of the Jewish people. If the ancestors of Jesus never would have been allowed to survive, in theory at least, Jesus would never have been born. Now, of course, that's only theoretical because we know it's God's plan and God would ensure he was, would be born. He would ensure he would be born through the vehicle, through the agency of the Jewish people. And so that's one reason why Satan hates the Jewish people. He also hates them because they are the writers of the Bible. Satan hates God's word. Any person who cooperates in anti-Semitism is a fool, is doing the work of Satan, is not only an ignorant racist, but is actually doing demonic work. That's a good thing to think about for a second. So we say here that God's relationship to Israel is based on the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. In the Bible, there are covenants that are conditional. In other words, they have conditions attached to them. For instance, the Adamic covenant, I'm sorry, the let me, I misspoke. The Edenic covenant, the covenant made in the Garden of Eden, is spelled out very clearly in Genesis chapter 2. And that covenant brought great benefit for mankind. You got to live in a very nice place. You got to live uh, in the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, as we say in Hebrew. And there was only one condition attached to that do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, of course, Adam and Eve voluntarily violated that and brought upon themselves their fall and our fall as well. And so that was a conditional covenant. 
you could you could break it. Adam and Eve could do something to break it. In contrast, the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. There's nothing we can do to break it. There's nothing we can do to keep it. In fact, if you research the Abrahamic covenant with a few of the verses I have here and other places where I, I've spoken more extensively on the Abrahamic covenant, when God formally inaugurated the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis, he actually put Abraham to sleep. <laughs> Abraham could not agree to the provisions of the covenant. He could not disagree. God simply made it unilaterally. He made it by himself. He swore by himself. It is an eternal, it's unconditional, it's irrevocable, or if you're, if you're from Brooklyn, it's irrevocable. And it is the covenant that continues to be in full legal force to this day. And we'll talk about that and we'll provide some evidence for that in just a minute. The covenant goes in there. You see the passages, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, in the, the handout and the, the paper documents that can be printed out for this course. I'll provide many more uh, passages to support our statements about the Abrahamic covenant. In First Chronicles 16 is sort of, it wraps up the Abrahamic covenant in a nice final uh, bow, as it were, because it says that the Abrahamic covenant is very specific. While it's made with Abraham, First Chronicles 16, 16, and, and other passages as well, clearly say that the covenant only goes through one son of Abraham, and that's through Isaac. We know that, Isaac, that Abraham had a number of children, the most famous of whom are Ishmael and Isaac. And God had a concern for Ishmael. Ishmael is the forefather of the great Arab nations. And God has a concern for them. He, God has a continuing concern. God loves the Arab people. I absolutely believe that from the bottom of my heart. And he's made provision for them. And so he made provision for Hagar to live. But the covenant with Abraham would go through only one of Abraham's sons, and that was through Isaac. Isaac had a number of children, Jacob and Esau being the two most famous. God says, I have loved Jacob. And so Jacob in turn then has 12 sons. And so here it is, here's the formal definition of a Jew. And I would submit to you that this is the only accurate biblical definition, despite what church men have said over the years. A Jew is someone, according to 1 Chronicles 16, who is a physical biological descendant of Abraham, through one of Abraham's sons, Isaac, through one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, and then through Jacob's, either any of Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. That is the very definition that the scriptures give about who is a Jew. Uh, there are lots of alternative definitions today that have flowed around, and I would simply and humbly submit to you that that's the biblical definition. Uh, your emails are welcome, and I will attempt to answer them, but I would submit to you that that uh, really is the final statement on what the Bible says about who is a Jew. Um, Galatians chapter 3 gives further information. That's a subject for another day. It's a much more developed. And again, we had already mentioned Romans chapter 11, the entirety of the chapter in the New Testament there. Romans is a relatively short book, and every chapter is important. Yet some people, unfortunately, would like to cut out Romans 9 through 11 because they seem to deal mostly with the Jewish people, especially chapter 11. But God has that there for your edification, to have you understand the importance of not only the Jewish roots of the faith, but the fact that God has a continuing plan for the Jewish people, that he has not abandoned them, he has not cast them off, despite what some church edicts have said. Those church edicts were directly 180 degrees in contrast to what the Bible clearly says. Read Romans 11. Compare it to some of the, the, uh, the, the uh, Reformation theological statements. Uh, the people who wrote some of those statements were gravely in error, or maybe someone didn't print Romans 11 for them. And so, very important to understand that. 